I know you like that. I know you like that. This is the Saturday show here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Welcome on in on this Saturday morning. My name is Jake Hatch. I am your co- uh, co-host typically here. Typically have Michelle Bodkin along for the ride, but she is on her way, making her way towards Rice Eccles Stadium. I'm sure there is a number of you doing similar for the 22 Forever game, uh, Utah's annual spring game taking place at Rice Eccles Stadium uh, at 11 o'clock this morning is when it will begin. Uh, so as such, Michelle will be uh, joining us up. Uh, from the road, as we like to say in our next segment. But wanted to say welcome in to all of you. Hope you're having a fantastic morning, day, whatever you want to term it, whenever you listen to this, whether it's live or or on demand. That's the best part about this show is we podcast all of this. If you miss it, you can go back and listen to it. Hey, it's what we do in, in the sports media universe these days. It's on demand. It's live. We cover it all. We have it all available for you guys whenever you want to consume it. But I'm going to dispense with a lot of the pleasantries on today's show because there is a lot to get to. There is a lot going on in the sports universe in here in the state of Utah. And we'll get back to uh our highlights of the week and the like uh, coming up next week. But uh, crazy, crazy news. Now, I will say this. uh, We have been alluding to this, kind of tiptoeing around it, saying it uh, in some circumstances. But, folks, the National Hockey League is coming to the Beehive State. Uh, I don't know how to say it any more clearly than what we have been saying here on the KSL Sports Zone all week long and all the shows, but... The Arizona Coyotes are coming to Salt Lake City. Reports emerged last night from Phoenix Sports, uh, Hockey Night in Canada, and then ESPN also had it. I'm reading from Emily Kaplan's story on ESPN saying, Arizona Coyotes players were informed Friday that the team is relocating to Utah, sources told ESPN, confirming a report by Phoenix Sports. Coyotes GM Bill Armstrong met with the players ahead of their game against the Edmonton Oilers, which, by the way, uh, the Coyotes won 3-2 to confirm what has been rumored all week, that the NHL is working to facilitate a sale to Ryan and Ashley Smith, the owners of the Utah Jazz. The Coyotes will begin playing there next season. Folks, next season is this October. That is how quickly this is coming together. You will see National Hockey League action taking place this fall here in Salt Lake City. I, I don't want to say that we've been under a, a, under reporting or under rating this move. But it is, it feels like in some ways it's been overshadowed uh, by uh, some of the other things going on in the sports universe. Let's acknowledge it for what it is. It is another professional franchise coming to Salt Lake City. It is one of the traditional big four uh, sports coming to Salt Lake City. The Utah Jazz for many, many years operated unopposed in the professional sports sphere here in the state. And uh, with Real Salt Lake joining the fray in 2004, they took a little bit of uh, an audience in their own right. They have more of a niche audience with Major League Soccer, but Essentially, we've had those two pro sports. Now, you also can mix in the Utah Warriors in rugby, uh, the Utah Archers in the Premier Lacrosse League that have recently uh, came come to Utah. Uh, there's also the Salt Lake Shred in professional disc, uh, 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 Ultimate Frisbee. So there is there are professional franchises here, but the Utah Jazz were the only one in Salt Lake City that we like to call the, one of the big four that called the Beehive State home. The National Hockey League is going to be the second one in here. Now, will we get Major League Baseball? It looks like that's a very real possibility, but that's probably not going to happen until the early 2030s if timelines has been projected by a number of individuals that cover MLB uh, uh, essentially uh, are right. The NFL, it seems like it's a pipe dream for the NFL to ever come here, but the fact that we could go from one to three of the big four sports in a five to ten year span is absolutely astounding to me. I think most of you understand that I am a native of this state. I grew up in Orem, Utah. I dreamed my entire life of having more sports to support, to go out and watch in this state, and it seemed uh, for many, many years uh, that it was just not meant to be. Salt Lake City was thought to be this backwater uh community that didn't have enough souls that could uh, facilitate supporting a one major league franchise or one um, a professional franchise, much less two or three. I think, uh, I think this state, I'm, I'm going to stump for my home state because trust me, I'm as, I'm as big a homer for the state of Utah as anybody out there. I'm going to say this. 
the fact that uh, there's been concerns about the Coyotes and the Jazz, I don't even. And there's going to be a rebrand of the Coyotes' name. It sounds like we'll see what the announcement is. There's supposed to be an announcement coming up uh, as soon as this Thursday, as uh, this coming Thursday, I should say, uh, from Gary Bettman, the NHL commissioner, announcing this move formally uh, of the Coyotes making the move to Utah. And I would imagine they would rebrand it maybe that very day or shortly thereafter. But the bigger news is is there has been some concern about these are two sports that literally overlap for the most part on their seasons. They both play 82 games. They both play from the late fall to uh, early summer uh, if the playoffs extend that far. And I can understand the concern of that. But let me just say this. The state of Utah, we are the quote-unquote state of sport. And I know, I know we have rabid sports fans here. I freely admit that I am uh, I'm relatively green when it comes. No, I'm not relatively green. I am very green in terms of my hockey knowledge. I am starting to do a deep dive on learning more about NHL and hockey in general because I want to be able to talk about it uh, coherently and smartly. And I welcome any and all feedback. If any of you are hockey fans out there that are listening to this show, hit me up on social media. I would love nothing more than to ask for your your help in helping me become a smarter uh, sports media professional when it comes to talking about the NHL and talking about hockey in general. But let's also just celebrate the fact that hockey is coming here. It's a professional franchise. It is absolutely going to have support. I don't care what other people who do not know what the dynamics of the state are, that love, love to, to, to crap on it at times, want to say that it won't, it won't work. You don't know that, and I, I I'm gonna bet the other. I'm just gonna go exactly the other way. The Utah Jazz have sold out the vast majority, if not all, of their games this season at home, despite them having a pretty rough run uh, since the trade deadline. Now they have had two very uh, decent uh, performances back to back here as the season wraps up, and the regular season finale is tomorrow afternoon out there at Golden State. But I- I'm telling you. We need to celebrate the fact that we have NHL hockey coming here. Yes, it's going to have to have a a new stadium built or or a new arena built or a barn, I guess is what they call it, in hockey. I'm learning hockey lingo. Let me let, hey, hey, I'm I'm getting up to speed, folks. They're going to have to build something or retrofit the Delta Center to be able to be uh, more amenable for the sight lines for hockey. We'll see what the ultimate plan is. But the Utah State Legislature has already earmarked uh, a bunch of money. Was it nine? Hundred million uh, for the hockey endeavor. There's a billion also uh, uh, on the books for MLB expansion. So the public-private uh, partnerships between the state government and obviously the Smith family in this regard, with regards to NHL hockey, are there. I, 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 this is awesome. I am very. Very excited to be watching, talking, covering, learning, and just overall celebrating the fact that Major League Hockey has come here to Salt Lake City. Well, I am I'm smart enough to know what I don't know, and what I don't know is what the Phoenix Coyotes are going to bring to Salt Lake City. So that's why I'm going to step aside here and let Ian Mendez, one of the uh, senior writers covering National Hockey League for The Athletic, he joined David James and Patrick Kinahan, the show I work on on a daily basis here on The Zone, uh, DJMP on Thursday morning, and he lends some insight into what the Coyotes' roster looks like, what he believes they are capable of accomplishing, because they've had a little bit of a rough run of their own of the, over the past decade or so with regards to making the postseason in NHL. Uh, so let's let Ian Mendez explain to you what to expect from the Phoenix Coyotes to make the transition now to Salt Lake City. What are the folks of Utah getting with the Arizona Coyotes? Well, in terms of a team on the ice, it's actually uh, a, a pretty good team, like uh, like a good collection of of young players. Um, you, you know, they've got um, uh, some some super talented kids there. A uh, kid by the name, a uh, young player by the name of Clayton Keller. He's a, he's kind of a game changer. Dylan Gunther is a young player. Like they've got a really good young collection of, of players, and and they haven't really been, uh, you know, a consistent playoff team. And, and part of it for them is I think they've just constantly just given their financial um, sort of constraints in the last few years. They haven't really been able to be a, uh, like a, like a legitimate team that can push for the playoffs. Like they've, 
boy, I, I want to say they've only made the playoffs once or twice here in the last, it feels like, decade or so. But they've got some really good players. Like I said, Clayton Keller's, you know, probably 24, 25 years old. Uh, he's really good. Logan Cooley was a first-round pick. Uh, he's a really dynamic player. Um, so, like I said, they, they've got some really young pieces that if, if they come in there and I think they get sort of the support, uh, you know, financially and, and maybe treated like a, a big league franchise, I, I don't think it's impossible that in a year or two from now they could be a, a, a legitimate playoff team. Yeah, they've missed the playoffs 11 of the last 12 years, and they're in seventh place in division now. But this season, it seemed like they had something going. Just looking at the record here, they were four games over 500 in late January. They dropped 12 in a row, and it has been a mess since then. What happened to a promising season where, okay, maybe they're building something, and then it just all falls apart? Yeah, and, and you know what? And the thing is, like, if you go back to September and October, there's a lot of people who said, you, you know, they could kind of be a dark horse if, if this and this and this and this happened. It, it um, you know, it, it, it could bode well for them. Maybe they'll challenge for a class spot. And I, I would say up until, you know, kind of the all-star break, which is early February, they were – they were that team. They were getting great goaltending from uh, Connor Ingram, who is uh, kind of this great, fascinating human interest story. He's, he's kind of overcome, uh, you know, some, some, some hurdles in his personal life, and, and he, he's having a great year. But, but he was playing, like, out of his mind in December and January, and he sort of regressed a little bit. That's, that's kind of been part of it. Um, you know, but, but they're just – they're just a young team. Like I said, they, they, they got some guys that um, – like, like Logan Cooley's a teenager, and it's really hard to be um, a great player in the National Hockey League really when you're a teenager. So um, I also wonder, too, um, how much this has been weighing on them. Hey, where are we going to be playing next season? Because uh, I think a lot of that stuff started in, in late January when people were wondering about, hey, what's the future of the Coyotes here if you've got groups – in like you know, Atlanta has expressed interest. Salt Lake has expressed interest. Kind of in that same time frame of late January, of and people have been wondering where the Coyotes are going to play. And you, you always wonder from a human interest perspective, does that does that play on the minds of the athletes if they just don't know where they're going to be in six months from now? There's really, a, as I see it, no way out for the Arizona people because even if they get this land that they're trying to buy and that's coming up in the auction in June, you're, you're still years away from that thing actually opening, and it looks cool next to the 101. I've seen all that. I grew up in Phoenix. I know the area, and it would be a great location, but it's still a long ways away, which means that they've got this oppor- – no, I won't call it an opportunity, but they're forced to play at the Arizona State Stadium. So this is, for the league, in a sense, this is – an easier way out. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. And, you know, and, and I've been down there to, to the campus of Arizona state a couple of times this season to, to cover games. And um, listen, it would be a great atmosphere for a college game. If you're going to watch NCAA hockey at the highest level and you're in a 4,800 seat venue or 5,000 seat venue, you'd love it. You'd say, this is awesome. This is great. Or if you were watching the Grizzlies play a game in that type of venue, you'd be like, okay, this is great. It just didn't feel like the big leagues. It just didn't feel like the the National Hockey League. And so um, I think they, we've reached that point of no return where, okay, even if you did secure that parcel of land and everything went the way you said it would, we're looking at at least three more years of playing in that in that venue. Whereas in Salt Lake, as, as you guys know, you got the Delta Center sitting there ready to go. And, you know, and I, I had a great conversation with Ryan Smith a few weeks ago. I uh, talked to some officials with the Jazz. Like, they're pretty confident that they can, right off the hop, okay, we can, we can get 11,000. I know it's configured for basketball, but they're like, you know, we, we can get about 11,000, maybe a few more. Well, right off the hop there, that's, you know, at least twice, if not closer to three times as much that you could get in, in Arizona. And then when they're ever done all of this arena uh, stuff in your city, now you're going to be playing in a in, in sort of a, a, a brand new venue that's, you know, tailor made for this, and that's probably going to be ready in and around the same time as whatever they're going to do in Arizona, three years, four years, whatever down the road. So, why wouldn't you, if you think that this is the ideal scenario, like like Gary Bettman in the NHL, they don't think about what's best for the next six months or eighteen months. They think about what's best for the next five, ten, twenty, twenty-five years. I think it's pretty clear that that Salt Lake is this sort of untapped market that they could probably 
go back to Arizona if they wanted to at some point. But in the here and now, why, why wouldn't you take advantage of a better arena opportunity at Delta Center and then, and then deal with Arizona down the road? We're going to go ahead and make you uh, the owner of the Utah whatever's they're going to be called. Given the history of, you know, missing the playoffs 11 times in 12 years and being seventh in the, in the division, if you own this club, would you blow everybody out, start, hire your own GM and your own head coach and start fresh? Or do you think there's enough momentum and enough growth that they really ought to stick with the people in place? And given that they get away from this cloud of negativity you referenced with the whole team playing the second half of this season with a doubt about are we moving and where are we going and what's happening, do you think there's something to build off of here? And you'd keep the group together and let them build whatever it is they can build going forward. Yeah, and that's a great question, right? Like, like I mean, if you look at, at – uh, franchise relocations in the past. Like when Denver got its team, the Colorado Avalanche in the mid nineties, uh, they kept a lot of the people, a lot of the roster together because they, they felt like they were on the precipice of, of greatness. And sure enough, in their first season in Denver, they won the Stanley cup and they kept the general manager and they, uh, you know, they, 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 they kept some continuity there. Uh, I don't think Arizona is on the precipice of being a Stanley Cup contender, but I do think that they're on the precipice of maybe being uh, a playoff contender. they got a really good, charismatic coach named Andre Tourney. And, uh, you know, what, what I think is really interesting is, you know, Ryan Smith, for all of his basketball acumen, uh, I think is pretty well connected to the hockey world. Like, I think he, uh, for example, you know, like I said, I, I chatted with him a few weeks ago. The thing I was really struck by was he's got a great relationship with John Cooper, who's the head coach of the Tampa Bay Lightning, who won two consecutive Stanley Cups a couple of years ago. John Cooper is generally regarded as the best coach in hockey. And, you know, Ryan Smith has a direct line to him, and I don't think John Cooper's going anywhere, but it it does open my mind up to the idea that, look, Ryan Smith is probably a pretty well-connected guy that – at the very least, will bounce ideas off of smart hockey people to say, you know, how how close is this organization? Where are the gaps? That type of thing. So, I mean, if you're going to be spending north of uh, you know a billion dollars or whatever to bring an NHL team to your franchise uh, uh, franchise to your city, I don't think it costs that much more to make some smart hires. Uh, really, it's just a, a drop in the bucket, so to speak. If you're going to go out and get you know better uh, coaching, better uh, guys in your front office that type of thing but but they the 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 shell of it is there for sure in arizona and and like i said i think they've built up a pretty good team i think you can make the argument that their inability to take the next step has been sort of predicated on sort of financial handcuffs we saw with the golden knights when they came to vegas they were winners instantly could you tell us how they were able to do it because obviously they weren't down for very long because it didn't happen that way and Arizona's been down, so explain to our listeners how it works in hockey and how you can quickly go from nothing to everything. Uh, see, and, and this is funny because the Vegas, Vegas Golden Knights came in the NHL in 2017. But here's the difference between Vegas and what potentially could happen in Salt Lake uh, with, with, if the Coyotes end up in your city, and that is Vegas was an expansion team, meaning they didn't have any – they didn't inherit – any players they literally came into the league and they're like all right let's just start from scratch and then they had an expansion draft so every team in the league had to protect uh, x amount of players and then sort of quote unquote scrap heap we'll call it vegas got to pick off the scrap heap now what happened was vegas was extremely smart uh they made some shrewd moves some shrewd trades and they just they got really lucky. They got really sm- They were really smart, and they were good right off the hop. They went to the Stanley Cup final in their first year, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Uh, it's almost an aberration, but they've been a really good operation in, in, in their first five or six years, but partially because they started from scratch. Uh, the situation that you're going to get, like I said, in, in, in Salt Lake City, if you get the Coyotes, is you're going to you're going to bring a handful of really good young players. Like I think if you went around the league and you asked people about the core of the Coyotes roster and where they're at, most people would say like that's a pretty good team. Like that that's a that's a team that with with the right tinkering and the right insulation, like I said, could be a playoff team as early as next year, but certainly in in two years. So. Vegas, it's really tough. And even Seattle, they kind of made their play, the playoffs as an expansion team in their second year. It's tough to 
kind of dem- expect that type of success right off the hop. But I think what, what's great about when you get a new team, I always think there's a honeymoon period, whether it's two years, three years, where people are just excited to come in. What is this? What's this hockey team everyone's talking about? And you get a little bit of runway to – you don't have to be great right, right away. And I think the timing of that might actually be perfect in Salt Lake City because I think there will be a honeymoon period of two or three years, and then it should coincide, I would think, with that Coyotes team, if that's who you get – being ready to be sort of a legitimate playoff Stanley Cup contender, you get your arena situation sorted out, and then you kind of really, in three or four years from now, I think can start to look at, hey, maybe we have championship aspirations here. There you have it, Ian Mendez from The Athletic. A big thank you to him for joining DJ and PK. If you want to hear the entirety of that conversation, that was about half of it roughly, uh, you can go search out DJ and PK wherever you get your podcast. It's also available on YouTube. Just search out DJ and PK under the KSL Sports uh, channel there on YouTube, and you can listen to it. And uh, Ian, I think, laid out a pretty uh, decent uh overall look at what the Coyotes offer. A young team that is trying to build from the ground up. Gee, that sounds familiar. Oh, it always kind of sounds like what the Utah Jazz are endeavoring to do here, and we'll talk about the Utah Jazz here in just a little bit. I thought David Block had a very uh, insightful uh, thought about how the Jazz are going about their rebuild that we'll get to at the top of the 11 o'clock hour, but getting back to the point at hand with regards to the NHL. Let's celebrate this, folks. This is an incredible, awesome thing. I, like I said, I'm a kid who grew up in this state. I stand for the state of Utah as much as humanly possible. I love living here. I don't plan on ever leaving this state. It's just, it, it's in my blood, quite literally. And the fact that we're having another one of the big four sports coming to Salt Lake City, opening the door for NHL to relocate here, and I'm expecting that Major League Baseball won't be too far behind in the grand scheme of things. It probably wouldn't take uh, until the early part of next decade, if you believe the timelines from a lot of the MLB insiders out there. But still, I'm a kid who grew up dreaming of having more professional sports to talk about, to celebrate, to root for in this market. And the fact that this is mere months away, six months away, roughly, give or take a few days, that is exciting to me. And I am going to fully embrace the Salt Lake slash Utah, whatever they are. If it is the Salt Lake Yetis or the Utah Yetis, great. Uh, I'm a big a fan of the Utah Sasquatch or the Salt Lake City Sasquatch. Uh, if you guys want to, by the way, if you want to, let's talk about it on uh, social media. Send in your name uh, suggestions for what you want this rebranded franchise to be uh, t- uh, named, uh, titled. What you want them to be named. I welcome it. Uh, Jacob C. Hatch on Twitter, KS- the KSL Sports Zone on Twitter as well. Uh, let us know what you would like to see the rebranded Salt Lake slash Utah, whatever they are. Insert a uh, name here uh, for this new franchise. But once again, Let's get ready, folks. This is going to be very, very exciting. I am excited to learn about hockey, to be able to talk about it intelligently, and it's going to be a summer's worth of uh, work for me to get caught up on missing out for the first 37 years of my life, essentially, uh, not watching all that much hockey, but looking forward to it all the same. All right, we'll flip over and talk some football coming up next. Utah spring ball coming to an end with their spring game today, the 22, 22 forever game. We're going to catch up with Michelle Bodkin, my typical co-host here on the program, coming up next, get her thoughts as she's on her way to Rice Eccles Stadium. So stay tuned. This is the Saturday show right here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Welcome back to the Saturday show here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Hope you all are doing well. It is time now to put the Michelle into the Jake and Michelle on the Saturday show as Michelle Bodkin is on her way up to Rice Eccles Stadium, the Forever 22 game, a.k.a. the Utah Spring game, uh, taking place today up there at RES. Michelle, what's up? How are you? I'm doing really well. It's a gorgeous day. I'm so excited to finally have a nice day for spring ball. It feels like it's been a few years for Utah. I think it's been a few years for it feels like every program out there. But when you get days like today, uh, you do, yeah, you don't want to let them kind of go by the wayside. But uh, looking forward to this one as always. Uh, give me your overall sense, Michelle. You've been obviously tracking and uh, going up to these practices all spring camp long. Uh, give me your sense of what, I guess, overall to expect from today's festivities. Yeah, you know, I think this is more about just having fun showcasing a little bit what they've been working on. Obviously, it's going to be a very vanilla version of that one to keep injuries at bay and two. 
uh, you're not trying to give your opponent any kind of film whatsoever. Sure. So, uh, although, you know, it's still on the Pac-12 network. So uh, good luck, Big 12 opponents, getting that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, I, I think Utah, based off of everything people have said, based off of things that have been told to me, based off of things I'm reading, you know, some of my fellow constituents putting out there, it really feels like Utah's in a very comfortable, happy place with how spring ball went. It sounds like they really kind of checked off the boxes that they wanted to check off. And, you know, I'm expecting just a really fun game to kind of celebrate all that hard work for them. Obviously, uh, this commemorates the life and legacy of, t- of two fallen Utah football players. Do you, do you feel like uh, th- this is the, the – people still are able to uh, – I'm trying to say this right. Are they still able to go out there and honor the life and legacy of, of two of their teammates, even though some of the guys that were teammates uh, of theirs have moved on? Yeah, you know, I think – I think it's just become a part of the culture. It's become a part of the way of how they run things. Uh, It's, you know, the, the work ethic that both Ty Jordan and Aaron Lowe displayed in their time at Utah is still talked about to this day. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think just the attitude and the leadership traits. And so while, you know, a lot of these guys now don't necessarily know these players, it, they're just a prime example of what a Kyle Whittingham Utah football team expects out of their players. And so I don't, while they don't know them, I, I think there's an understanding there of this is what the expectation is. Uh, this is what the expectation always has been, but it is better embodied in a way. Uh, and, and there is, I, I don't know, like I still get chills talking about it. Like I'm goosebumpy right now. I just think, there's something interesting at play when you talk about 22 forever, when you talk about the lives and the legacies of both Ty Jordan and Aaron Lowe, uh, that I, I, I don't think it's ever going to fully go away or fully disappear. Like it, that memory is really going to always live on for as long as people continue to tell that story. Now the the backup quarterback storyline's kind of been, uh, in my opinion, the most dominant one on the offense, offensive side of the football, and we'll see if the, how far that carries into the, to fall camp, etc. But uh, is there another storyline offensively, Michelle? Do you feel like has developed this spring that maybe we have overlooked? You know, I think we maybe haven't talked as much about the running back room as we probably should have. Uh, you know, that is a place where I think they're kind of sort of replacing um, some talent there. Uh, and, and they're kind of coming off of, you know, some years that have maybe been a little bit harder than you would typically expect with injuries, with guys not handling their business on and off the field, that sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, you're kind of starting over, but you had some nice base pieces. You have, of course, Mackay Bernard coming back. And he just barely talked about how, sitting on the sideline last year just really helped him learn the playbook. And, and as he said, it's not that I never knew the playbook before, but it just helped him, I think, digest it in a different way. And so when you have a bunch of new guys kind of in there that haven't necessarily had to play a whole lot, you now have a leader that can act as a second coach. And Quinton Yanther was actually telling me that Makai has been very helpful in getting a lot of those guys up to speed, explaining things, you know, pulling guys aside, and just really taking the time uh, to make sure that everybody's on the same page, everybody's ready to go. Uh, you have a guy like Jalen Glover that's been in the program for quite some time, and it sounds like he's just getting more comfortable with what it is he's supposed to do, what's expected of him. Obviously, he's going into his juice. I guess technically it would be his <laughs> junior year, but I yeah. believe he's a redshirt sophomore, actually, okay. now that I think about it. Uh, but... Uh, you know, so, I mean, at this point in time, though, either way, he's been here three years, right, regardless of what the title is. And so, you know, you, uh, at this point, you expect him to be more comfortable and to be able to take on a bigger chunk of the leadership. Uh, and then you have a guy like Charlie Vin- Vincent, uh, not necessarily a key player per se, but just a guy that's been in the program for a long time. 
and, and everybody talks about his football IQ is through the roof. So again, that's kind of another coach like player. Uh, and just a, again, a good foundational guy. Uh, he's maybe not necessarily the best at anything, but he's just solid all the way around in the way that he operates. And then, you know, you have the smattering of new guys that we don't know a whole lot about. Hopefully we'll get to see them a little bit today uh, and get a feel for what they look like and what they bring to the table. But I, I think that's maybe the room that I'm just, I'm surprised that we didn't talk a whole lot about them, but I think there were things to talk about. Now, I, I did get a chuckle. Uh, Kevin Reynolds of the Salt Lake Tribune asked uh, Kyle Whittingham about potentially chasing the portal quarterback uh, in the transfer yeah. portal period. And then the best answer I thought on the whole bunch of it was when he asked uh, Andy Ludwig about it, Michelle. And I, I'm assuming you probably heard this. And he said, well, if that's what the head coach wants to do, that's what we will do. And it, <laughs> we, you and I both know Andy. It just that's kind of that goes to the point of who Andy is. What do you think the realistic possibility is that they do look at the transfer portal for a quarterback? I, I think they absolutely will take a look. Uh, you know, I think Utah is very lucky in the sense, and I mean, we'll see transfers out. I would be really surprised to see anyone at this point that Utah would really want to keep exiting the program. But then again, it's, you know, it's a wild, wild west and you just don't know. But I, if things go the way that I think they logically should go, uh, Utah's in a very lucky space that – it feels like they they have everyone they need. It's just shoring things up. And I think quarterback is in one of those areas they might want to shore up a little. And it's not that they're not pleased with what happened. Cam has come back and progressed every week and is looking more like his old self. There's no concerns there. Brandon Rose, I think, has maybe surprised people a little bit in that he really – took a jump from where he was at in fall camp when he got hurt, but was kind of going to be the guy uh, up to that point uh, and, and had really just elevated what he was doing then this past four weeks in spring. In fact, I think Kyle Whittingham said this past week that he's probably played his best football as a youth to the, to this date. So, you know, that's a really great development that he's getting where they maybe want him to be. And then, you know, you have the freshman Isaac Wilson, who has shown really well for a freshman. Uh, I'm going to guess, I'm going to venture a guess that probably asking a lot to to ask him to be the backup quarterback this year. And not that he couldn't surprise people and end up doing that. Uh, But I think the expectation is we're not putting that pressure on him unless we absolutely have to. And so then I think, you know, you just want maybe one more guy in there if you if you can get a solid contributor. And that, that's where Utah's at. They're, they're not taking bodies to fill, desperately fill holes. They are looking for solid contributors at certain, certain spots, and quarterback is one of those spots. Flipping over the defense for a moment, uh, it feels like the defense, even though it's to replace their safeties they're, uh, at that position, it feels like they've got a very strong uh, defense. It feels like on paper, Michelle. Uh, w- where do things stand on the defensive side of the football? Is there any, I guess, a group that you're looking a little closer than others? Yeah, I, I think Utah, I think that's where the most questions were for Utah to answer was, was in the defense and specifically the defensive backfield, the safeties, and the one cornerback spot. And it sounds like they got their answers. They they had a lot of the guys in-house, K.O. Johnson, Smith Snowden, uh, all those guys, you know, have really stepped up to the plate. And then they did a really good job from everything I'm being told in their evaluation uh, of bringing guys in that look like they are going to be big gets for them. Uh, Talking about Oh, goodness. Uh, oh, why am I blinking on his name? Johnson. Oh. Uh, the transfer from Georgia Tech. Yeah, uh, uh, but <laughs> yeah, I Keenan. Know. Keenan. Keenan. Keenan Johnson, yes. I, trust me, I was, right there, Johnson. I was right there with you. I'm like, ah, I, I saw the tip of my tongue. Anyways, go ahead. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's the worst when that happens, and it's always the most inopportune moments, too. Uh, so you're welcome to, you know, listen to me fumble that on radio. It's fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, I mean, he's impressed he's really come in and impressed coach Shaw was talking the other day about how 
he's had some great cornerback come through his room, but this guy's speed, his closing speed on plays is elite and, and has left him a little speechless. Uh, he, he, he kind of said, I've never had anyone that plays like he does. So, you know, uh, I think that's incredibly encouraging. And then Cameron Calhoun from Michigan also has been a great ad for him, is doing some great things. The great depth piece has maybe a little bit more that he needs to work on and grow with, but, but there's optimism there for him. So I, you know, I think, I think Utah got all the answers they wanted on defense. Uh, and I know that there's maybe some question about linebacker with, Lavani de Mooney, you know, getting the, the long-term injury. I hesitate to call it a season-ending injury because it was never referred that way out loud. Uh, but he's certainly going to be out for some time, and, and Utah's going to have to deal with that. Uh, but it sounds like Sione Foto is ready to step up into that role. He's not that mission rust off, uh, and he's going to be good to go in that third spot in Utah's linebacker room. So it's it sounds so Pollyanna, like everything's good and great, but like I, you, you can just kind of feel the energy. They feel really, really good about where they are on both sides of the ball. Can I ask you this, Michelle? Are you surprised that Kyle Whittingham has continued to do a spring game all this time? Because uh, you, you know I cover BYU football pretty heavily, and Kalani kind of referred to it as like, we don't really like the spring games. Or like you said, you don't want to show anything to your opponents. Do, do, are you mm-hmm. surprised that Kyle has continued to have a traditional spring game? Yeah, it's like a yes and no for me all at the same time. Like, I, I with the way he is about injury reports and yeah. some of that kind of stuff, it's like, well, yeah, I'm kind of maybe surprised. But on the other hand, I think Kyle looks at it as another day of practice. And it ends up being, you know, kind of fun for the fans. It's a way for them to kind of engage, especially now that a lot of the other stuff has been shut down from years past. Uh, so there's maybe a little bit of anticipation for the event. And I think the guys like going out and playing in front of the crowd, that seemed to be a consistent message uh, those, the past couple of days during media, uh, is that they're excited to get out there and, and kind of sort of play, you know, a game the, the way that they would in a regular season. And I think even more so this year after the kind of year that they had last year where a lot of guys sat out with injury. So uh, I I can see it both ways, uh, but I think the benefits for for Whittingham, for Kyle, far outweigh the negatives. And so I think he feels like he can vanilla it up enough that, you know, it's, it's just all in good fun and you can't really take anything from the game. Now, you and I have talked about this. This is kind of one of those rare things. This game is going to be televised on the Pac-12 network, but this is a program headed to the Big 12 Conference uh, officially on July 1. But uh, give me your give me your sense of how Utah feels as they get ready to join the Big 12. Have they talked a lot about uh, early preparations or anything like that this spring? You know what? It's just been business as usual. Uh, it's, I, I don't recall a whole lot of exciting, interesting conversation around the fact that they're moving conferences. I just really, I'm sure they are preparing and looking into, uh, you know, what they're going to be facing in the Big 12. But I think to them, at the end of the day, it's really no different than what they've been doing in the Pac-12. And so it's just a, you know what, we're just going to shut up and get to work. That's really kind of the attitude that's been there. I think there's some excitement to maybe play some new teams, uh, but I don't think they're looking at it as this crazy novel thing, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. No, it makes a ton of sense. So uh, looking forward to it, Michelle. Obviously, we'll be uh, tracking all your work, kslsports.com. Looking forward to uh, seeing what the outcomes are, but uh, thanks for carving out some time, and we will catch up with you next week, all right? 
sure will. And enjoy the rest of your day, day, Jake, and have a great rest of our show. There you go, Michelle Bodkin, typically my co-host sitting opposite me here in studio, but a big thank you to her for taking the time as she is on her way up uh, to Utah, their spring game, the 22 Forever game. Uh, looking forward to that, and once again, keep it, uh, keep your eyes on kslsports.com for full recap, all the uh, reaction to that as Utah wraps up spring camp. All right, coming up here in just a minute, we're on hour one of the program by uh, going and looking around the world of sports for the more dumb or stupid things out there. There. It is technical fouls, and it's coming up next right here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. If you're coming from the street with dirty shoes on your feet, that's a technical foul. If you switch the radio to some modern music show, that's a technical foul. If you touch the thermostat, you'll get hit with a bat. Because that's a technical foul. You will feel my wrath. That's a technical foul. Personal file, 69, offense. He was giving them the business. A technical foul. As you just heard, it is time now for technical fouls here on the KSL Sports Zone, where we talk about the more dumb and uh, just overall bad things in the world of sports and hand out what we like to call technical fouls. Let's start off with the ongoing saga involving Shohei Otani and his former interpreter, Ipe Mazuhara. Now, uh, most of you know that Ipe Mazuhara stole allegedly even more than $16 million. You heard that right. One six, $16 million from Shohei uh, to cover and at least help cover his gambling debts crazy, crazy things. Uh, he is now under federal investigation. He turned himself in and then somehow was able to get freed on $25,000 bond. This is a guy, folks, that if you believe what the DOJ and the uh, U.S. Uh, attorney, uh, I guess the U.S. attorneys out there that are uh, prosecuting this, he racked up $180 million in gambling debts. Yes, he did win 140 some odd million, but he has $41 million outstanding that he owns. A, he owes to at least one, if not more, odds makers, bookies, if you will, that apparently are have been threatening and all kinds of crazy stuff. One of the bookies, if not the main one he's been working with, was already under DOJ investigation. And California is one of the states, like the state of Utah, where uh, sports betting is not legal currently. Uh, just, I I don't know. I don't know what is going on here. Uh, but uh, Ipe Mazahar was surrendered to, to law enforcement yesterday. He was released on bond shortly after an unsecured $25,000 bond Colloquial known as a signature bond. That means that he does not put up any cash or collateral to be released. If he violates the conditions of his bond, he will then be on the hook for $25,000. So there you go. That's why he was able to be released. But uh, this is crazy. And he's been ordered to undergo gambling addiction treatment. Yeah, if you racked up 180, 180 plus million dollars in gambling debts... Holy smokes, dude. And by the way, he hoodwinked, apparently, Shohei to plunder more than $16 million from him to help cover this. And he also, in the, if you read some of the stories about this, uh, one of the bookies reached out to him and said, hey, I'm glad Shohei's covering for you. And then he essentially says in a text back, oh, no, he's not. I've been stealing from him. Bro. <laughs> Uh, don't put things on the record. That, first off, that the DOJ can you know, subpoena and, and pretty much nail you for. But this is a crazy Crazy story. Uh, they have maintained all along that no bets were placed on baseball. It's incredible to me to think that he racked up $180 million in gambling debts. Yes, he won quite a bit, 40, uh, $140 million in winnings, but $41 million a hole that you were in, I just, man, this is absolutely nuts. So, and a technical foul on um, Mizuhara here because it's just, I, man, I don't know what, uh, what he's going to do here because that's a lot of money that, by the way, if you think you're going to rack up that type of dough, where, where's it going to come from? You're going to have to take it from a guy like Shohei who's got all that money. I, I, I don't know. I, I just don't get it. Uh, staying in the, I guess, the world of betting in a way, but it, it relates a little bit. Uh, a wrestler, a two-time world champion, Olympic broad medalist by the name of Frank Chimizo, said he turned on a bribe of, of $300,000 to deliberately lose a match in last week's European Wrestling Olympic qualification tournament in Baku, Azerbaijan. Uh, Chimizo, who competes for Italy, 
shortly after emigrating from Cuba in 2011. Controversially lost the semifinal match to Azerbaijani freestyle wrestler Turan Bayramov. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Following a disputed late call, I uh, said this, quote, I knew I had to give a double, triple in Azerbaijan because I was fighting in their country and they had brought everybody. Uh, I did it, but then something ch- ch- happened that is echoes of wrestling many years ago. He says this, I, I want to say it. They came to me and offered me $300,000 to lose. I don't want to say who, but it happened the morning of the weigh-in. Chimizo says he refused because, quote, I don't only represent myself, but also Italy. It's not easy to break my integrity. So props to Chimizo. Even though he still lost, uh, he uh, could have easily been on the take for that 300 large. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that as a as a wrestler, it's not necessarily like baseball where you're collecting uh, $700 million contracts. In the case of Shohei Otani, but... Uh, principled man it sounds like for Mr. Chimizo so technical foul on whoever the cronies were that were trying to uh, bribe him and buy him off but uh, Chimizo I get a little bit of gold star there for holding strong now one final one technical foul goes to Terrell Suggs he was arrested earlier this week in Scottsdale California on charges of threatening and intimidating and disorderly conduct with a weapon stemming from a March 10th incident outside of a local Starbucks in Arizona according to the police report Suggs who is 41 now was driving a black Ford Range Rover uh, excuse me not Ford Range Rover a black Range Rover that had driven past the drive through order area. Upon backing his vehicle up, Suggs allegedly made contact with another vehicle. While there was no damage to the vehicle, an argument ensued per the report. Then a second argument ensued as Suggs left the Starbucks, Suggs allegedly uh, threatening to kill the alleged victim from the other vehicle and, oh, by the way, brandished a handgun in his left hand. Terrell Suggs, bro, you can't do that. You've had an incredible career. He's got like uh, just one of those all-time type careers from what he uh, did for the Baltimore Ravens. But, geez, you can't do that. He played 17 years in the NFL, 16 of them for the Ravens, made seven Pro Bowls, 2011 AP Defensive Player of the Year, a really, really talented player. Uh, but this is a bad, bad look. I uh, said this. I was in a quiet area of Scottsdale in the middle of the day on a Starbucks drive through near my home when an incident happened in a vehicle behind me. I was getting coffee. I was not looking for any trouble. When the man in the other vehicle escalated the situation, I feared for my safety, not knowing what his intentions were throughout the incident. I was the one who felt in danger while fearing I would be followed home and for the safety of my family nearby at my residence. Well, uh, alas, you have now been charged, and you will be uh, facing a judge, it looks like, and uh, we'll see what happens. All right, so uh, crazy, crazy stuff out there in the world of sports, but, man, I it, it seems to never stop out there. So uh, we'll come back on the other side, though. We'll get back into some basketball talk. David Locke had a, an interesting look at how the Jazz rebuild uh, – probably should uh, look in his mind, and I agree with it, and it actually uses a modern day uh, from this season, actually, uh, a look at a team that the Jazz have played recently that he says is kind of the the cautionary tale of what the Jazz don't want to do. We'll get to that next, right here on the Saturday Show. Welcome back to the Saturday Show, Hour 2 of the program underway right now. I'm Jay Catch. Thanks again for joining us. The Utah Forever 22 game uh, just beginning up at Rice Eccles Stadium. So uh, Michelle Bodkin is up there covering that for the station. I think uh, Serafita Simanu is, as well as I think PK uh, might also be up there. So there'll be plenty of coverage coming on kslsports.com as well as we'll have it here on the KSL Sports Zone in the week ahead as well. But uh, big thank you to all of you tuning in wherever you might be here on this Saturday morning. Hope you're all doing well out there. Uh, But let's talk a little bit about the Utah Jazz. Now, the Utah Jazz have been, let's be honest, they've been really, really struggling uh, down the stretch here. Notwithstanding the fact that these past two games uh, against uh, the Houston Rockets and the Los Angeles Clippers, they have picked up two wins. Uh, So a 13-game losing streak where it looked like the Jazz were very likely uh, to lose out. Uh, They bounced back with back-to-back wins. The regular season finale will be tomorrow in uh, San Francisco against the Golden State Warriors. That'll be a 12-30 pregame, a 1-30 tip uh, here on the KSL Sports Zone to tune into that. But uh, the thing about the Utah Jazz is we're all looking at this, and we understand that the Utah Jazz are going through a rebuild. It's clear as day. the, The front office, led by Danny Ainge as the CEO of the Utah Jazz, along with general manager Justin Zanuck, which, by the way, I want to wish once again uh, best wishes to Justin as he recently underwent a kidney uh, a kidney transplant procedure. 
hope all is well with him, obviously. But uh, the Jazz have bounced back. They're now 31 and 50 on the year. Won the game last night, 110 to 109 over the Los Angeles Clippers. They beat the uh, the Houston Rockets the night before that, 124 to 121. So it's good to see the fight from this team and see guys like uh, 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 Lucas Shamanich, Kenneth Lofton Jr. last night, 27 points. I think he had 20 of them in the first half. Very impressive stuff uh, from uh, these young players as they have shown some. A nice resiliency here as the season is uh, winding down. But David Locke uh, was was on with DJ and PK yesterday on the KSL Sports Zone for his weekly visit, and he had a very interesting look at what the Jazz rebuild is going to entail from his perspective. And I actually subscribe to his theory here because he actually points to the Houston Rockets as to why the Jazz probably want to avoid doing what the Rockets did. Without further ado, I'll let David explain right here on the KSL Sports Zone. The Jazz have a couple options going forward here. One is, you know, stick with the young guys, draft, keep building, try to hit on some draft picks and watch the young guys take off. The other thing is to add some veterans in the mix and try to speed it up. And I remember talking to you at the start of the season. You thought, okay, Houston's adding veterans into the mix and trying to speed it up, but adding the right veterans and how far can they really get before they bump into a ceiling. And the Jazz management's been real clear They want their ceiling to be legit championship contender for multiple years. They've laid that out multiple times. Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks, that's adding 60 to 65 million bucks, not just this year, but next year and the year after. That's a big chunk of the payroll right there. And they missed the play-in, which I think um, you were not very surprised by, judging by what you thought about their moves back in the fall. Do you look at any differently now? Is this a real warning to Jazz fans who are thinking, hey, speed it up? Well, look what happened in Houston. Um, kind of analyze the rocket season and, and how can they improve from here? Because if they do improve from here, you know, no one year in a rebuild is that important as long as you get to the right place. So I think a bunch of things. Here. This is a great question. So, first of all, Fred Van Vliet's contract is three years, $120 million, but the last year's not guaranteed. So, it's really a two-year, $80 million deal. So, that one's super interesting to me. Do you sign, if you're the Utah Jazz, a two-year, $80 million contract to DeMar DeRozan just so that you have some level of, like, I don't know, relevancy? And you actually can compete on a nightly basis? It's great. I think it's a great debate for you guys. Number two is I do think the Rockets had, the Rockets had won sixty games in three years. Sixty games in three seasons. Yikes! Their kids had not played a relevant, important basketball game, and so I think there that's a that's problematic. Like, I think the fact that Jalen Green got better this year because he actually is playing games that matter with ramifications and that Jabari Smith got better because he's playing games with ramifications matters. On the other end, they have Amon Thompson, uh, Amen Thompson, Jabari Smith, and Jalen Green who are all top five picks that they can build around for the future. And so now they've made the pivot to signing veterans. And I think there's something to that model that for three or four years you acquire young talent and you pivot. The, the last thing, though, I'll be really frank about when I look at the Utah Jazz – is like LeBron and AD are making probably one more run. Steph and those guys are making one more run. Minnesota's going to be great next year. OKC's going to be great next year. New Orleans is going to be great next Like Obviously, pending mass chaos, which we really would like to see, probably, frankly, we would like every upset and mass chaos to take place here in the playoffs. So it disrupts things. But, like, Sacramento's not making the playoffs this year. And I don't think they're making the playoffs next year. And I can't figure out how we're possibly going to be better than Sacramento. So there is part of me that feels like I could go in front of Ryan Smith, Danny Ainge, Justin Zanuck, and Will Hardy and be like, hey, actually the answer is sign Lowry to an extension and don't do anything else. And really go to 20 wins and then draft and then start maybe at that point. But the West is just murderer's row right now. And I don't actually see a great path by which we're like making the, certainly making the playoffs or even the play in next year. Now, maybe something materializes, but if you're not going to do one of those two things and you don't have three years 
of 60 wins like the Rockets, then I, I'm not sure why you do that two-year $80 million deal just to be respectable. Um, and so, I don't know. I can make a really, really strong argument. In fact, I think I'm kind of leaning that way right now. But if I, if I were in the Jazz front office pending mass chaos, uh, maybe the answer is that you're starting Keontae George, Bryce Sensabaugh, well, probably, yeah, Collins, uh, Lowry Markinen, Taylor Hendricks, John Collins, Walker Kessler, with John Collins, Walker Kessler coming off the bench, Collins Sexton coming off the bench, and I don't know what happens to Jordan Clarkson in that scenario. Um, but, like, yeah. And that your eighth guy is one of your rookies, and your ninth guy is one of your draft picks. And we're not very good. But I'm not entirely sure that's the wrong move. How hard is it to be patient, though, for those guys? Well, I think there's a direct correlation between how much pain you're willing to take and the, the, the system is built in a manner where I do think there's a direct correlation between the amount of pain you're willing to take increases the amount of chance you have for future success. Right? Yeah, I hate pain. Right, I do. <laughs> but, like... If you decide you just want to be the 10th best team, that's not that painful. It's mediocre, but it's not very painful. You can, you're competing every night. You know, yeah, like Houston yeah, didn't have a very yeah. painful season. Yeah. Frankly, Golden State didn't have a very pain, you know, like Golden State's probably pretty engaged right now. They're going to close the year winning nine of 10. I think they might make a run and, you know, but like, and Golden State's maybe a little different because that's a bad example, but, um, but like if you're building, yeah, that's yeah, that's zero pain. We can do that. But I, I don't think that's leading you to any chance to go on. To your point of the Rockets, the Rockets route to becoming a great team is Jalen Green, Jabari Smith, and Amon Amon Thompson developing. That's it. It's Dylan Brooks and Fred Van Vliet are they they can move your meter from twenty to forty. They just did that. That's cool. They and good coaching moved their meter from twenty to forty. But Fred Van Vliet and Dylan and Brooks aren't moving your meter from 40 to 45. Those are hard wins. Yeah. But maybe they help. 45, to, 45 to 50. Like that's where the Tim Conley trade for Rudy Gobert. I still think it's a great trade by Minnesota. I think it's an absolutely awesome trade by Minnesota. But maybe getting from. So, yeah. got him from like, you can't get people to get you from 45 to 55. Rudy can get you there. Maybe Houston getting from 20 to 40 helps their young guys develop so the young guys don't get beaten down, have the bad body language, not hustle back on defense because they need those guys need some wins mixed in. They need some positive feedback while they're struggling and learning, which is part of the – inevitably, most guys have to do that unless you're Tim Duncan. Well, good for you. But most guys have to do that and to not get any positive feedback. I mean, I get why shoulders are slumped and the body language isn't good and the hustle isn't there. I don't think you can be okay with it because you'll never win if you play like that, but I do get why guys get beaten down. It's, it's kind of human nature, and so for Houston not to get beaten down because, you know, Van Vliet and Brooks are helping them get from 20 wins to 40 wins, they're getting some positive feedback, they walk off the court feeling good, that helps them put in the work to develop, and we'll see if it pays off down the line, but I get the logic to that. And they had, and I think, you know, and it gave someone for the rest of those guys to look at, like, well, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. Like, how am I supposed to act? What am I? So I think that's super important. And you go back to the 76ers in the beginning of the process, and they just had nobody, in the, no adults in the room. Um, but, you know, on the other end, like, I do think they're a little bit of an outlier and they've become everyone's favorite model. And I don't think it's a very logical conversation, but. So Shea Gildas Alexander, maybe he's just a unique bird, does go through two years of terrible losing. They were 20 and 60 for back-to-back years. Um, and comes out of it as one of the five best players in the NBA. Right? You need the unique birds to win. That's what that's what yeah. separates you from teams. Uh, great teams separate from very good because they've got that. All right, David. So, yeah, I, I think it's a great – I mean, I, I want to make sure everyone – I think you're – I think you and I are both right, and this is the crux of the difficulty of the process. And that is, I'm not sure the false run up the mountain is actually worth it just to look good. And you're absolutely right. Like, just getting your head beat in every night with no semblance of... No hope. 
uh, of hope is not a great model either. Yeah. So it's really hard. Well, maybe that's why they're paying Markin and Collins to be those guys. They don't have to bring them in. They got those guys on the roster to yeah. be those guys. Yeah. Be the professionals, be the grownups in the room, and be so good that you drag the team to 40 or 45 wins, and that's why you're getting paid the big money because those guys are getting, assuming Markin gets this extension, you know, that's that's big money and, for a lot of years. Yeah, and you know what? John Collins and Dylan Brooks probably have a lot of similarities in kind of their level of play on teams, and Fred Van Vliet and Larry Markin probably have a lot of similarities. So to some extent, you know, you're, that's a great analogy. Good job. David, you're really good at this. When did you start doing this? Every once in a while. There you go, David Locke. And, yes, I agree that the Houston Rockets are kind of the thing you don't want to do when it comes to this rebuild for the Utah Jazz. You don't want to put a, quote-unquote, I'm calling it a facade on your rebuild. Bring in some veterans that uh, essentially cover up what you're ultimately trying to do with the young players on this roster. But DJ had a very good point as well at the tail end of the piece of that conversation. And, by the way, if you want to hear the entirety, that's about nine minutes and change of David Locke. It was about a 20-minute conversation. You can go search out once again. And DJ and PK on the KSL Sports Zone uh, and check out that entire conversation. David's always good every single week here on the show. But uh, the bigger point is yes, you don't want to have uh, bringing some veterans to make it look like you're making progress. Uh, progress, excuse me, when you're really not. Uh, let's be honest. The, what did the Houston Rockets accomplish this year? Oh, they finished a spot out of the play in. Great. You're paying guys like Fred Van Vliet, whatever the incredible number is. I think it was two years and $80 million guaranteed that David Locke mentioned. You don't want that. The Utah Jazz have veterans, as DJ pointed out, on this roster right now who are the veteran voices in the locker room. They are the pros that are showing the young players how to go about conducting their business at the NBA level. That's good enough. And obviously, I think Lowry Markinen, in my mind, should be a guy that's worth uh, re-signing on a probably close to max deal is what I would imagine it ends up being, if not if not an outright max deal uh, for the Utah Jazz. But uh, the thing with the Utah Jazz is they are trying to endeavor to build up what they like to say is a championship window that can extend for quite a while. And is that ultimately going to come to fruition? Only time will tell. And I know that uh, it it irks you as the lay Jazz fan out there for us out here in the the sports media to say, hey, be patient. we're not patient by human nature, just period. We are not patient uh, beings out there. We don't want to sit idly by for four, maybe five years with the hopes that uh, if everything goes according to this master plan, that then the Jazz will be competitive. I have faith that Danny Ainge, Justin Zanuck, Ryan Smith is the Utah Jazz owner, have a game plan in place that they can execute in the not-too-distant future. Does it get executed as soon as this offseason? Is it executed next year? Does it, is it two years down the line? I do not know. I wish I did because, trust me, I am as... Uh, I'm as confused at times by what the Jazz are endeavoring to do and some of the moves they have made. But they want to create a true championship window for a squad. I think they are looking at the Oklahoma City Thunder, the Denver Nuggets, as franchises are trying to follow in those footsteps. And what what is what what is what do you mean by that, Jake? Well, look at what Oklahoma City and also Denver, more importantly, I think, have done. They have drafted young talent, they have molded it, they have allowed it to grow up and mature, and they have benefited from it. Uh, Denver's further along in their process, obviously by virtue of their most recent NBA title, the first in franchise history. The Oklahoma City Thunder this year finally looked like the team I think they have been hoping to have for three and four years now. The Jazz are kind of in the beginning stages of that transformation. And the hope is that you can essentially have a rise similar to those two franchises, and this is just me speaking uh, from my perspective, of what I think the Jazz ultimately want to have work out for them. And if you can find the Shea Gilgis Alexander or the Nikola Jokic slash Jamal Murray of your team, uh, Jalen Williams, or Oklahoma, like those star players that they have found via uh, trades, more, more importantly, via the draft, That is how you're going to have to go about building what I believe will be a championship-caliber squad here in Utah. Once again, is it going to be a very quick process? It doesn't seem like it. And sure, it's been, I'm sure, quite bothersome to have watched the Utah Jazz front office short-circuit this team two straight trade deadlines in a row. I I completely get the, the frustration with that. 
But I got to, I guess, just speaking to the positive side or the glass half full side of things, is I got to believe that Danny Ainge and the Utah Jazz have a game plan in place that they are trying to execute to open up an extended championship window for the Utah Jazz. Is that as soon as the back half of this decade? Only time will tell once again. But the the issue is, how long are we going to have to watch what was some fairly putrid basketball down the stretch uh, here in this season? Like I said, notwithstanding these two wins the back in the last two games, the back-to-back here, that's very impressive, and I will give the Utah Jazz credit uh, for grinding out those victories. But it is still something to, that baffles me in so many respects, looking at what the Jazz ultimately are going to be able to accomplish in the near-term future versus the long-term future. And I would sure like to see uh, them... Uh, Speed it up, but do it the right way. And maybe the, the speeding up is exactly the wrong way to go about it, similar to what David Locke was talking about. But, ah, man, it is it is a thoroughly confusing time out there with regards to what the Utah, the Utah Jazz are trying to do. This is a franchise that for so many years was synonymous with routinely winning 50 games and going to the playoffs and going fairly deep in those playoffs for uh, decades, it felt like, at, at points. So, uh, I can understand the frustration that Jazz fans feel, but let's all try and keep a little bit of a positive outlook. I'm mean, Look at me preaching to you, but here's the thing. The Jazz are trying to win. I'm not. I'm not saying they're gonna. They're trying to dump every game out there, and they're trying to be sucky forever. I don't. I hope not, at least. But the bigger point is, is I think the Jazz are trying to execute a game plan here, and uh, it's led to some fan frustration. But the hope is that the short term pain will be long term gain for the Utah Jazz. And, uh, it's a, it's a weird weird deal, obviously, to, uh, to keep track of it all. But uh, coming up next, once again, by the way, uh, regular season finale tomorrow. Uh, Golden State Warriors, Utah Jazz, 130 tip. That'll be a 12:30 pregame here on the KSL Sports Zone. Also on uh, K Jazz and Jazz Plus. If you want to tune into it and watch it uh, tomorrow afternoon. All right, uh, we will come back on the other side. We'll get into five minutes of talk about some of the other topics out there in sports. Uh, there's one that uh, we have not touched on that I've been meaning to spend some extra time on. So maybe. They'll dominate the conversation, but it involves obviously the Mark Pope departure from BYU. Uh, where do things stand for the Cougars with regards to replacing him? We'll delve into all that as we continue on right here on the Saturday show on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. <music> Welcome back to the Saturday show here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Jay Catch along for the ride on this Saturday morning, and it's time now for five minutes up. We're probably going to spend a little more than five minutes on our first topic today. Uh, let's talk about the BYU basketball program. Now, uh, we talked about it earlier this week. Mark Pope has been hired as new head coach with the Kentucky Wildcats. He's on a five-year deal, averaging $5.5 million a year. If you want to uh, kind of do the math on that, uh, he has got a $27 million contract contract and frankly uh right out of the shoot uh there were some BYU fans saying that well, why wasn't he loyal to BYU let me just say this Mark Pope played for the Kentucky Wildcats he was a team captain of their 1996 national championship squad he played for Rick Pitino if there was one program I mean one program that it didn't matter if BYU offered him a lifetime contract 10 million dollars a year etc that he was going to say thanks but no thanks to it was the opportunity to go and coach in Lexington Kentucky for the Kentucky Wildcats he loves that program it's been his dream job for years I talked with enough people this week about about Mark Pope and the lead up to him ultimately being hired for that job that told me, Jake, this is the dream scenario for him as a coach. And I can't fault him for wanting to go to Kentucky. So I wish Mark the best. I I have worked alongside and around him uh, since his time as a BYU assistant, his run through UVU as head coach there, and ultimately the past five seasons at Brigham Young University. And I wish him and his family well as they make the move now to the Bluegrass State to lead the Kentucky Wildcats. The bigger question now is it was where B, where does BYU turn with regards to replacing Mark Pope and uh, I will also say this time is of the essence 
for the BYU basketball program. And uh, any of you who uh, know how BYU operates traditionally with hiring coaches, it's usually a drawn-out process, can take uh, multiple weeks, if not a month, uh, to get things done. Uh, But this is an era of collegiate sports, and especially with BYU being a member of the Big 12 Conference and the overly successful campaign they had this past year, finishing fifth in the Big 12 after being picked 13th out of 14 teams going into the season. You cannot afford to have this uh, this momentum that Mark Pope built for you. You're one of the Big 12. You can't afford to let it fritter away. And that is the concern I have for the BYU basketball program right now. If BYU administration and also the church uh, 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 board of trustees, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, if they are going to hold up this process and want to go through multiple rounds of interviews with candidate or, or with a candidate or candidates for this job, they are running the risk of having this entire roster, which looked quite strong uh, coming back. Uh, BYU is projected as high as 10th in the way too early top 25 polls that came out in the aftermath of UConn's uh, back-to-back national championship win on Monday night. They are, BYU is considered to be almost a like consensus top 25 team going into the next season. If you allow this to fritter, uh, not fritter away, but if you allow this uh, process to drag on and you have multiple people who feel like they should have a say in the matter, uh, have, have interviews with whoever you're considering hiring, you are going to run the risk of having multiple players, if not the entirety of the roster, or at least the uh, the con- major contributors, enter the NCAA transfer portal and go elsewhere. Uh, some of them could end up in Kentucky with Mark Pope. We'll see how that shakes out. But we've already seen at least two uh, who I think are maybe the two most key players on BYU's roster, NIL, uh, not NIL-wise. Uh, they're leaving for NIL reasons, but uh, the most important guys on the roster, I think, in terms of BYU system they ran this past year and point guard Dallin Hall and star big man Ali Khalifa, those two have already entered the NCAA transfer portal and they're looking at their options. This is what you run the risk when it comes to coaching changes and why I believe it is absolutely imperative for the BYU basketball program to identify who is the leading candidate, get them through whatever rounds of interviews or interview that they need to go through, and get them hired. You've got to get a coach in place. Ideally, I think by midweek next week at the very latest, if you want to be able to keep this roster intact. I know I maybe I'm I'm barking up the wrong tree by uh, going out on open uh, radio and essentially putting BYU on notice, but here, here's the situation. With NIL, the transfer portal, and just the overall uh, free-for-all nature of college athletics, and in particular college basketball right now, BYU could find themselves being picked fifth in the Big 12 next year and finishing 13th if they uh, let this process of identifying and hiring a new head coach drag on for multiple weeks, if not maybe a month here. You cannot afford to have that happen. Otherwise, once again, like I said, you're going to find yourself near the bottom of the Big 12, and it's absolutely legitimate this year, or speaking of if you, if you had that roster fall apart. Mark Pope had put together a very, very strong group of guys, and if you can get the right guy in there, and uh, we'll talk about candidates here momentarily who I think uh, could keep that roster intact, but it, this is, this is a, a shot across the bow of BYU administration. You got to get with the times. You got to speed up this process. Maybe they are. Maybe they are doing it behind the scenes and we just haven't uh, been privy to that information. But I am sincerely hoping that BYU does not uh, does not uh, twiddle their thumbs and uh, sit idly by while watching precious moments and precious precious time uh, get uh, away from them and see this roster uh, fall apart. And that would be an absolute uh, disaster for whoever ends up uh, taking this job. Now, who ultimately could take the job, Jake? Well, that's a great question in and of itself. I am uh, going to stump for my guy, Chris Burgess. I think Chris Burgess is the perfect candidate to take over this job at BYU. Yes, he does not have head coaching experience uh, to this point in his college coaching career, but this is a man who has paid his dues. Remember, he was a highly highly uh, recruited basketball star. He had that controversy down there at BYU with the whole uh, comment from Roger Reed, you're letting down 9 million Mormons when he didn't pick BYU. You know what? That's 30 years in the past. If you're going to hold that against him, I I got another conversation we need to have uh, off the air, I, I, I suppose. The thing is, is that Chris has been humbled, as PK mentioned, by this game. He had multiple injuries during his playing days. He played a long time overseas, and he has worked his way up methodically through the coaching ranks. This is a man who went into college coaching at the junior college level. 
It, he is he has paid his time. Uh, paid, paid, he has paid his dues and done his time. I mixed my metaphors there. Uh, he deserves this opportunity. Yes, Mark Madsen was, I, I thought, maybe the favorite in the clubhouse. But literally minutes, it was 15, 20 minutes after the official announcement came from the University of Kentucky of Mark Pope's hire being made official down there in Lexington, there came a statement on uh, Mark Madsen's uh, Twitter feed saying, hey, I am committed to Cal. We are, uh, me and my wife, we're excited to be here. We want to be a part of the Golden Bears and the build that we're undergoing right now. He didn't outright say that I'm not interested in the BYU job, but I think the timing of that all but said that uh, for BYU. And in many respects, it actually allowed BYU to essentially say, okay, well, we can cross Mark Madsen off that list. Let's move on to the next uh, candidate. And I believe that the favorite should and is uh, Chris Burgess. And we'll see. I-, I am very interested to see where things ultimately stand. Uh, when uh, this all shakes out. But I would love to be back here midweek next week at the latest. Monday would be ideal, I feel like, for BYU to be making an announcement that we're excited to hire Chris Burgess as the next head coach of the BYU basketball program. And why do I think Chris Burgess is the right hire? Well, because he has got a a lot of ties to BYU, having spent time helping Mark Pope build what he built in Provo. He's recruited a number of the guys that are on BYU's roster currently. He could uh, could get into the ear of a guy like Dallin Hall and say, hey, come back to BYU and play for me. Colin Chandler, I'm sure that he could help secure him coming home off of his mission to join the program. Who knows? Maybe there's some guys on that Utah roster that maybe uh, would follow him to Provo. That, That is all absolutely in play. I do know that uh, Chris Burgess is very highly thought of in recruiting cir- circles. Uh, other coaches at the prep, junior college, and other ranks, they like how he operates. He is a very, very good uh, recruiter. Obviously, he's going to have to sharpen up his X's and O's, but that's the thing I think he's been working on most the last two years, in particular at the University of Utah as the associ- associate head-, head coach under Craig Smith, is sharpening up operating as a head coach, albeit not uh, uh, standing up all the time. He's been working on the bench, but I'm sure he's been observing Mark Pope, uh, obviously working alongside Craig Smith. He's been observing how they operate as head coaches, and I believe this is the time for Chris Burgess to step into the limelight and get his shot as a head coach. Yes, it's a step into the unknown for BYU, because until you really are that guy, you don't really know if guys have that it factor to them when it comes to coaching, but it's, it screams to me, and like I said, I'm biased in this respect because this is just my thought process on how I think BYU should operate in this uh, in this coaching search. But I believe that you could do a lot worse than giving a, an opportunity to Chris Burgess. He understands what BYU stands for, uh, having worked there and recruited for that university. I know he didn't play there. I know that he played for the hated Utah Utes. He was a rival of BYU's during his playing days, at least the last two years of his career because he started out at Duke. That's all water under the bridge at this point to me. And I would hope that BYU gives a strong, long look. And uh, if it can be managed, hire Chris Burgess and hire him yesterday. Just get it done. Now, other candidates on the list, I think the next guy, for whatever reason, Chris Burgess does not uh, float the boat for BYU. I think it goes to UNLV associate head coach Barrett Peary. Uh, Barrett, as many of you might uh, know, is a native of Payson, Utah. Played his college ball at Snow College in southern Utah before embarking on a coaching career that took him ultimately to a head coaching position at Portland State from 2017 to 2021. Didn't necessarily go all that well and he was let go, but uh, he has worked at Texas Tech in the Big 12 ranks. He was most recently working at UNLV, and he has got a very long coaching resume. Uh, Is it time for him to get a second look as a head coach? Can he make that step up to the Power 5 level and take what he learned from his short stint at Texas Tech in the Big 12 and bring that to BYU? TBD, but uh, there are other names out there. I'm sure many of you are wondering about Alex Jensen and or Kevin Young, who are career, uh, not they're not career guys in the NBA, but they've been in there for quite a while. Both of them natives of the state of Utah. Both of them have uh, extensive resumes in the N- NBA ranks. And I mean, I said, did I say NFL? I apologize if I did, but NBA assistants. And if uh, they are interested in this job, great. But uh, PK, Patrick Kinahan, who I uh, trust with uh, what he he says a lot because I know who I know the caliber of people he talks to. Uh, he essentially said yesterday that Alex Jensen is not interested in this job at BYU. So you can kind of cross Alex Jensen off of that list. Uh, I think a similar uh, situation 
exists for anybody else working in the NBA? Why do you want to step away from a, a, a league where you're uh, coaching the best athletes in the world and then have to go and jump in and recruit year round, deal with NIL demands from athletes and also have to worry about the transfer portal and re-recruiting your roster literally seemingly month by month, if not every four or five months. It's not an ideal scenario for a coach, but uh, we'll see how BYU navigates here. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing who they ultimately hire. But if they were to ask me, and I, I will be also be very honest, uh, they will never ask me because they don't. I don't think they value my opinion for much of anything. Uh, but alas, if they did, I would tell them the guy is Chris Burgess, and you needed to hire him yesterday and get the get the deal done because you need to keep this roster as intact as humanly possible. And every moment, every hour that you take to let somebody else who wants to have their thumb in the pie to make that. Decision, decision slow down the process it's costing a BYU valuable valuable uh, moments when they could be uh, building a roster that I think can absolutely be in the mix at the top half of the Big 12 next season so don't let this momentum fall by the wayside BYU get on it all right a couple other things real quick before we uh, uh, take our penultimate break here on the show I do want to mention also uh, in terms of uh, the uh, RSL slash Utah Royals side of things on soccer this is five minutes of so we'll hit those real quick Uh, Real Salt Lake is back in action tonight riding a three match unbeaten streak most recently tying 1-1 with Minnesota United tonight they're back home at America First Field they'll be taking on the 2023 MLS Cup champs the Columbus crew uh, Cucho Hernandez uh, one of the best players uh, for Columbus got a red card last week and he will be unavailable uh, for uh, Columbus in this game tonight uh, I am not going to be on the broadcast tonight for those of you wondering I've got some family responsibilities but Spencer Warren and Lauren Beck will have pregame coverage co- for you coming up at 6 30 uh, 7 30 first kick out there at AFF and if you want to get tickets you can go to rsl.com last night the Utah Royals uh, lost one nothing uh, to the Orlando Pride, Marta, the Brazilian legend, uh, tallying the only goal in the game. So a tough loss for the Utah Royals. But uh, I think Amy Rodriguez's squad this season, it's it's more about getting uh, what is one of the youngest. Is it the youngest? It might be the youngest in uh, NWSL, the National Women's Soccer League, uh, in the entire league. It's about getting them all on the same page this season. I don't think any of us had any illusions, those of you that are soccer fans, that the Utah Royals were going to be world beaters in their, re- uh, their re-debut here in Salt Lake City, but a tough loss for them against the Orlando Pride. They'll be back in action next week as they take on Racing Louisville. That's quite a name as they head out uh, to the Bluegrass State to take on uh, their fellow NWSL club out there uh, in the in the Midwest. All right, so there you go. That's what's going on in soccer, and it's just kind of an interesting, interesting time uh, with uh, we're transitioning into the summer months, so it's kind of funny how things slow down here at the station, but at the same time, we talked about hockey earlier today. Things pick up a uh, in, in spots that you don't necessarily anticipate them. And it feels like this is going to be the summer of hockey uh, for Utah sports fans out there. But it's a fun time. I love what I do. I, I say this all the time on social media. I say it on here often. I love working in the media. I love covering uh, what I do, and I love representing the state and talking about what you want to talk about uh, here on the Saturday show and my other opportunities to talk on the KSL Sports Zone. But it's going to be an exciting summer. A lot of us, uh, yours truly included, will be learning a lot about hockey, it feels like, with the impending move of the uh, Arizona Coyotes to Salt Lake City. I am uh, very curious what the rebrand will look like, the nickname that they will pick for this squad. Will it be a Utah whatever, or will it be a Salt Lake City uh, team, how are they going to name it? There's a lot, a lot to watch for in the coming days, quite literally. I'm expecting an uh, an announcement as soon as Thursday uh, from Gary Bettman, the National Hockey League uh, commissioner, about the uh, change in terms of selling the franchise Uh, to Ryan and Ashley uh, Smith and having the Coyotes move north from Arizona to Utah to call the Delta Center home uh, for the interim. Uh, What is the plan uh, for a new stadium? Will that uh, be uh, forthcoming with regards to plans on that? Are they going to renovate the Delta Center where it stands uh, for a second time? And I think it's less than, maybe it's 10 years at this point. I don't know. We went through it when we were working over there in the Delta Center with the zone. But uh, there's some crazy crazy times it feels like coming uh, for Utah sports fans, but get ready, folks. Let's embrace it. Let's embrace this uh, hockey team as they uh, come to Salt Lake City, and I think it's going to be a very, 
very fun time to be a sports fan here in Utah. And uh, I, I'm on board. I, I'm tr- trust me. I'm going to be as big a hockey fan as I possibly can be. And once again, it's going to take some uh, study for me to get up to speed because I can't even tell you for the life of me. If, if somebody were to say, Jake, you, you can win a million dollars if you can t- explain to me what icing is right now. I wouldn't be able to do it. I would lose out on that money. That's how much of a uh, of a greenhorn I am when it comes to my hockey knowledge. But uh, I will say by come the open of the NHL season in October, I would hope I'd be able to explain that as well as a few other things when it comes to hockey. But uh, we'll, we'll see where things uh, stand at that point. We'll be doing the show here, so uh, maybe we can visit, revisit that uh, in four or five months' time. All right, we will wrap up today's edition of the Saturday Show coming up next. Some final thoughts as we wrap it up here on the KSL Sports Zone. So stay with us right here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. <laughs> Welcome back to the Saturday show here on 97.5 DKSL Sports Zone. Hope you all are doing well out there, wherever you might be. A big thank you to all of you for tuning in on today's show. Uh, rolling solo is never uh, easy here on the show, but the nice part is we've had a lot of topics to talk about today. We've talked about the impending move of the Arizona Coyotes coming back to Utah. And uh, once again, let's get ready for that uh, announcement coming as soon as this Thursday, it appears on that front. We've also talked about the Utah Jazz back to back wins as they get, uh, they're going into the final game of the regular season. There is an offseason ahead for this Utah Jazz squad that I think holds a whole lot of intrigue. What are the Jazz going to do in the NBA draft? Are they going to take uh, multiple players in that draft? Will they... Uh, uh, bundle some assets together, including other future first-round picks, maybe uh, go out and trade for a player they believe can be a part of their core. There is so many options on the table here for the Utah Jazz. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and just other st- summer sports. Uh, the Salt Lake Bees, by the way, have won four of their last five as they start the season, and it's been fun to hear Tony Parks on the call as the new play-by-play voice of the Salt Lake Bees, and you'll hear plenty of him. Uh, upcoming this spring and summer here on the KSL Sports Zone as they play out their season. We've got Real Salt Lake. We've got uh, the Utah Royals back in action. Uh, there's a lot going on. And by the way, speaking of soccer, uh, before we wrap up today's show, I probably should have fit this into technical fouls, but I found it uh, right actually right after we got done with that segment. Uh, April 12th is the dateline. Uh, this comes uh, from UPI, United Press International. Uh, a fan. Uh, this is the, this is the first sentence. A fan uncoiled a whip and used it on hit striker Abdurazik uh, Hemdala after Al Idahed's uh, lost Al Halal in the Saudi Super Cup finale in Abu Dhabi United Arab Emirates earlier this week. The incident occurred when Hemdala exchanged words, words with a man who was talking to him from the stands Thursday at Mohammed bin Zayed Stadium in this game. Brazilian uh, midfielder Malcolm scored twice in a 4-1 win for Al Halal, and then uh, obviously this incident played out. Folks, why in the world are you taking a whip to a soccer game? <laughs> That's that. That's the thing about this. I'm trying to figure out. The man says that uh, that uh, Hamdala, Hamdala, excuse me, uh, scored the only goal for Al Idhad in the in their loss here. He went to, uh, on to near the man in the stands before throwing water from a water bottle onto him. The man then used his left hand to pull out his whip, hitting Hamdala several times. Once again, why does this gentleman have a whip at a soccer match? I don't get it for the life of me. I, it's just. Crazy, crazy scenes. Uh, I need to go find the video of this and watch this play out if it, if it exists. I assume it does. Everything in the world, it feels like, has video associated with it these days. But, man, uh, soccer remains just an absolutely insane sport. There are so many unique things about that sport in and of itself. And I just... What what are you doing? You know I'm gonna hey uh, I'm I'm gonna go to a soccer match today. I'm gonna bring my whip with me and I'm gonna use it on on a professional soccer player. Where where does that where does that come from? Like where do you get uh, that mind? I don't know. It, it, for the life of me, I do not understand it. But alas, uh, that's what played out over in the United Arab Emirates earlier this week between two uh, professional soccer teams. It's just I man, bizarre, 
bizarre stuff. All right, um, one other thing before we go here I wanted to talk about. It's on the college uh, sports, college athletic side of things. So Troy Dannon, uh, the new AD at Nebraska, uh, he says he expects revenue dis- distribution in college sports to become more performance-based over time, resulting in what he calls an eat-what-you-kill model. Uh, now, Dannon was hired at Nebraska last month after less than six months with Washington. He told ESPN that the future model for the college football playoff mirrors what will happen around the greater college athletics landscape. Uh, of course, last month, the CFP and ESPN agreed to a $7.8 billion contract over the next six years with a revenue di- distribution plan that gives the Big Ten and SEC schools the most money, $21 million annually, as well as significantly... Um, more, uh, it's, 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 excuse me, it is significantly more than teams from the Big 12, the ACC, and obviously the G5 ranks. Uh, but as he said here, there's going to be some meritocracy versus more of a social appro- approach to revenue distribution. You'll eventually see that within the leagues. You'll eventually see that across sports, maybe other than football. And eat what you kill in some respects, that mentality. It's going to be much more performance-based and outcomes when it comes to generating the revenue necessary to compete. The CFP decisions that have been made so far show that. Uh, now, Troy Dan and I think he's trying to essentially uh, posture and uh, say that, hey, we're, we're Nebraska. We're going to be in the mix here. But he's also kind of putting like a warning shot, I think, across the bow of big dogs in the Big Ten. Speaking of the Michigans, the Ohio States of the world, USC, I'm sure, is going to consider, consider themselves that as a member of the Big Ten Conference, which, by the way, still... The fact that USC, UCLA, Washington, and Oregon are going to be in the Big Ten just baffling to me. It's just, it, it doesn't sit right with me. It never will sit right, it feels like. I'll get used to it at some point, but it just, it does not make much sense. But I think that Troy Dan is essentially trying to strike out right now, early on in his run in Nebraska, and say, hey, I see what you guys are trying to do. I see that Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, you guys think you're going to essentially throw your weight around and get more money uh, from the conference. Well, guess what? We're Nebraska. We're also going to be in the mix here. Now, he makes a very good point because I do think that the big dogs in these conferences are going to try and pull this off. They're already doing it. He already mentioned it. What the college football playoff did with uh, not being a flat rate across the board for all the power leagues where essentially the two biggest leagues are getting the most money, the next two leagues, including the league, the BYU, and Utah will call home uh, this fall in football, uh, getting, uh, I think it's $12 million uh, per team, according to what the payouts have been scheduled for from the playoffs. So it's $9 million less uh, than the schools in the Big Ten and the SEC. Yeah, it is meritoc- it is meritoc- It is a meritocracy out there in college sports, but at the same time, Man, uh, I just don't know if the if the future of college athletics can hold up with uh, that happening. Because let's be real, if the Ohio States, the Michigans, who have already got extremely, extremely deep pockets, essentially demand and take more from other teams in those leagues, let's look at the other teams. Let's look at the Northwesterns of the world, the Maryland's, that type, that type of stuff, the Rutgers out there in the Big Ten and say that, okay, yeah, you guys are going to take less while these guys get more, even though they already have more. Uh, that doesn't necessarily bode well, I think, for the future of college athletics. But there's a lot going on in college athletics I think don't bode well for the landscape in college athletics in general as well. So maybe I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here, but it's just it's, it's a really, really weird uh, vibe going on in college athletics right now. And uh, we'll see if Troy Dannon was uh, prescient with what he said there, if he is forecasting the future, or if it uh, becomes, like he said, goes back to maybe more of a social approach versus uh, that meritocracy uh, type approach that he believes will take over here. All right. Uh, I am going to step aside now. So big thank you to all of you for tuning in. Like I said, it, it's it's both thrilling and a challenge to do a radio show on your own, but I appreciate Each and every one of you have tuned in all day long. If you missed any part of the conversations that we've had on today's show, you can podcast it, search out the Saturday show wherever you get your podcast. It's also available on YouTube as far as I'm aware as well. Uh, Go to the KSL Sports channel. You should be able to find it uh, under that. But once again, a big thank you to all of you for tuning in. Big thank you to Christian for producing today. And uh, Michelle and I will be back next week. By the way, we're going to be on location next week. We're going to be out at Mulligan's, 106 South. You guys know exactly where it's at. We'll be out there for the Uinta Golf Demo 
of days if you want to uh, hit some new clubs and see uh, if you need to upgrade or switch out your uh, your set of golf clubs, uh, come out and do it. Say hi to us. I believe we're going to have some vouchers for, for some free food, as I understand it, as well. Uh, they'll have some uh, f- uh, food vendors on site. At least they did the last time we did this. So looking forward to that. I'll be 10 to noon next week, once again, out at Mulligan. So uh, make plans to stop by right now, and we'll see you guys uh, next week. All right, once again, that'll do it uh, for this edition of the Saturday Show. Thank you to all of you for tuning in. Once again, I'm Jake Hatch. Have a great rest of your Saturday uh, right here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone.